So what does the book reveal about in the correspondence between your father and Marcel Duchamp? What does it reveal, you think? Well, it was a 15-year friendship and um, it was and still is the first historical monography of Marcel Duchamp and um, it was written by my father but um, most people ignore the fact that they collaborated intimately for 15 years to write it and um, Marcel for instance did the layout the extraordinary layout of that book is signed as a work by Marcel Duchamp you see and so the Getty Institute um, published the letters yeah. in French. They were written in French. And then we had them translated by Paul Franklin. And uh, so it's a bilingual book, which is the first bilingual book that the Getty Institute ever published. And you so insisted for it to be published in French? For 13 years. They wanted it to be only in English. Uh, so I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> bilingual or nothing. And after 13 years, I fi they finally accepted. That's why it took so long to, to be printed. It's a great book. But it speaks a lot about the intimacy. Yes. About the state of mind more, yeah. more than anything. And, and they had something in common, which was their particular ma <coughs> madness about language. The calembour, wordplay. Yeah. And um, there's an interesting photo in that book, which I'm sure you noticed. There's Marcel Duchamp, there's my father, and there's Jacques Lacan. Yeah. And those three guys were always playing with words, with language. They drove everybody crazy around them with that. And calembour sur calembour, as we say in French. And your father. And your father, what was doing your father in the same time? He was expert at Drou, no? Yeah, Auction he was, out. He was an expert art historian, yes. But in parallel, he was helping Marcel Duchamp for... Well, he was uh, writing about him and he was, you know, my father had, like you, like me, like everybody, at least two or three different lives. We're never only one life, otherwise we'd be bored to death. So. He had many, many lives, and one of those lives was to be the first biographer of Marcel Duchamp. That's it. And in, in, in the book, one can see, or it's written, that you wrote that they, consist, they consider themselves uh, as outsiders. Absolutely. Marcel, who is now probably one of the most considered, one of the most important artists, philosophers of our time, not of the 20th century, but of our entire time. Some people say at least as important as Picasso, perhaps more, always considered himself as a marginal, free re rebel outside the capitalist art market system, which he looked upon with disgust and amusement. And he was always surprised when um, museum directors or collectors were interested in what he was doing. He thought it was a joke. But now that the art market has caught up with him, I'm sure he's laughing in his grave. <laughs> but in fact, with Arturo Schwartz, he redid some of his work in the 60s. He did, but... It was a very complicated affair. Arturo didn't ask Marcel directly. He asked Tini, Marcel's wife, and told her, you are the wife of the greatest artist of our time and there's nothing to sell. And she said, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I have an idea, we'll make replicas. And, that's, and she convinced Marcel. See, it was a triangular affair. And in fact, Marcel was very much amused about all that. He considered ready-made as a, a sort of lithography, you know? 
and you you sign twenty copies of lithography, and um, there was impossible to find a work by Marcel Duchamp today. But he, but but uh, what was how, how could he live? What was he? He lived with nothing. Really? He had one jacket, one pair of pants, one pair of shoes. He had a very small studio on 14th Street. He had just tobacco in his pipe. He, he, he lived like a monk, very with very, almost nothing. And uh, Tini uh, was paying for the apartment and the food. So he was satisfied with living the life of a poor young artist. Yeah. He had no taste for luxury. Okay. You see, he was completely anti-American. He was not a consumerist at all. And so he had few needs. And if you have few needs, you're more, much more free. Yeah, but uh, a monk who, who likes sex very much, right? Well, all monks do. <laughs> <laughs>